All right, let's do this again. Hello, hello, it's Lance, and I'm making this video just after finishing watching part two of the new Get Back docu-series. If you missed my thoughts on part one, or you don't even have a clue what I'm talking about, go check out yesterday's video. I'll link to it at the top of the screen right now. It's probably on this side. Before I even talk about the details of part two, though, here in this video, I want to be completely honest with you. I'm kind of gutted after watching it. Now, I'm a grown man, right? But my emotions are kind of wrecked at the moment. Um, I'll go out on a limb here and say that if you think I'm blowing this out of proportion, you just don't get it. This is not Bohemian Rhapsody. It's not Rocket Man. This is genuine. And this project, it more closely realizes the Beatles' original warts and all vision for the Let It Be project than that film itself. Yeah, Get Back Part 1 ended on a low note, with George Harrison leaving the band and the band's future up in the air. I expected all that. But Part 2 has its ups and downs as well. And even it ends on a bit of a cliffhanger, even if we all know how the story ends. Now, I'm not sure where other serious fans stand on this. I have friends who are Beatle bloggers and Beatles podcasters and all that stuff, but I haven't connected with anyone on this. I haven't read anyone's thoughts, except for a few folks who commented on my Part 1 video. So maybe I'm just way off base here. Maybe I'm overthinking it. But I didn't expect watching this to feel like such a roller coaster ride. My love for this band and their music runs deep. But I guess I thought this series was going to be a rehash of what we already knew, just told in better technical quality. It's not. It's contextual. It challenges narratives. And unexpectedly, it's not a 180 from the Let It Be film. If Let It Be is a storm cloud, I think many thought that Get Back would be a sunny day. But really, it's an honest portrayal of what was actually happening, the ups and the downs. Anyway, with all that stuff out of the way, let's look at something I mentioned in the last video, the narrative. Even though Get Back isn't a scripted movie, it of course still has direction and storytelling. Otherwise, we'd just be watching 50 hours of raw video, and not that anyone would complain about that. But in this storytelling, I noticed a narrative focus developed in part one on two main themes. One, how does this project end? And two, the Beatles wanted or needed someone else to join the band, if only temporarily. And man, did all this come to fruition in part two. The, the buildup was there all along. Let's talk about the ending of the project first. We all know how it ends on the Beatles' rooftop, but in part one, original director Michael Lindsay Hogg did plenty of coaxing with the band, trying to get them to dream big on an ending for the film and to commit to it. And in part two, most of the influence he had comes crashing down, and his coaxing turns into hand-wringing. Now, considering the Let It Be film was his project, we didn't see this house of cards fall so spectacularly. I'm not knocking Lindsay Hogg here, but you have to wonder if the Let It Be film wasn't so lackluster, partly because of his emotions getting in the way. I'll also point out that the Get Back documentary says that Glenn Johns and Michael Lindsay Hogg suggest the idea to go up on the roof to Paul. I'm not so sure that it's that cut and dry. So I might be picking a nit here, but check this out. In early 2019, before the Get Back documentary was even announced, I put together a two-part series here on the Fab Four Archivist channel on how the Beatles chose the rooftop for their final live performance. Of course, there is some information overlap between my project and the Get Back series, but Peter Jackson and co. also left out some details. So I'll take this opportunity to quote myself. Let's get to the heart of the matter. How did the rooftop become the venue for the live performance? Some Beatles books have said that the rooftop idea was officially conceived at a meeting at Apple on January 26th, just four days before it happened. But it's possible the seed was planted a bit earlier. For one, on January 8th, while still at Twickenham, John Lennon mentioned he enjoyed playing on a rooftop while in India less than a year ago. I just found it to have the, the to a good feeling about, about singing about in the song, again. you know. Yeah, it'd be like on the roof yeah. at India. Also, tapes reveal on January 25th that band members had gone up to the roof, perhaps to scout it out. As for whose idea it was, there are plenty of claims, and none are definitive. Recording engineer Glenn Johns said he suggested it to the band. In fact, he did enthuse very early on in the Get Back sessions about recording for the band outdoors. All right, so if you haven't watched that series, you should. In total, it's approaching a million views. I've linked to it down in the pinned comment below this video. The other narrative that parts one and two have in common is the need for someone to join the band musically. 
Besides the need to fill out the sound for the new songs, I think they also knew that an outsider joining their ranks would get everyone on their best behavior. And that's exactly what happens when Billy Preston walks into the studio. Billy doesn't say much on camera, but his smile lights up the room, and his playing adds some life, literally some soul, into the songs. Again, I feel like this is something that Die Hard fans have read about and knew, but seeing it play out like this is a really big deal. Especially on those off days when Billy's unavailable, the band just seems to get back to having no direction. Related, one thing that I saw develop that wasn't really part of any official narrative was unsung hero Glenn Johns. Throughout the Get Back project, his role is understated, but it's necessary. He comes off as a less heavy-handed George Martin, offering direction, but ultimately letting the band forge their own path. I believe if it wasn't for him, I think the final audio product, technically and musically, would not have been salvageable. Now's not the time to dig into his work on the Get Back LP mixes, but fans really do owe him a debt of gratitude in more ways than one. Aside, his book Sound Man is a must-read for any classic rock fan. Glenn Johns is a legend and a great storyteller. There's a link down in the description. All right, so big picture stuff out of the way. I want to chime in on the technical aspects of part two. And good news, actually, there's not much to say other than it sounds and looks amazing. The Twickenham footage from part one was okay, and the colors were great, I guess, but the lighting was really poor in many scenes. I think Peter Jackson and his team did the best they could with what they had, but frankly, I'd expected more. Part two, on the other hand, it's bright, it's vibrant throughout. So I'm getting my hopes up for the rooftop footage to look just as good, if not better. Also, and fortunately, the VFX work that I noticed in part one is not as obvious here in part two. That's a good thing. As for the sound, let's remember that almost all of what we're hearing was not recorded with a typical music studio setup. Rather, two mono Nagra recorders were used, I believe. The film nerds or gear nerds, they can correct me or clarify down in the comments if need be. So when the sound switches to a proper multi-track recording for a song away from the Nagra reels, it reminds me of when The Wizard of Oz goes from black and white to Technicolor. Now for some of my personal highlights from part two. First up, the take of Dig a Pony around the one hour, four minute mark almost feels like a standalone music video. Again, the visual quality is stunning compared to what we've seen before, not in Get Back Part 1 necessarily, but going back to the anthology series and the Let It Be film. And as I just mentioned, the sound absolutely knocks you out. Next up, about 10 minutes later, we hear an attempt of She Came In Through the Bathroom Window. So as I was watching, I jotted down in my notebook that I really appreciated the emphasis in Get Back on the eventual Abbey Road songs. Seeing the band consider these songs for the ending of the film reminds me that officially starting Abbey Road was only weeks or months away, as it truly was, as opposed to what feels like a long time separating these two projects. All right, next highlight. More than any one Beatle, I'm a fan of their recorded output as a group. Yeah, again, it comes back to the music. So that means that I'm also a huge fan of the production techniques and studio work that people like the engineers and producers did. And here in part two, we get to see much more of this. For instance, we see Paul get asked to play his Rick bass instead of the old Hoffner. And also, we see George Martin stuff the grand piano full of newspaper upon George Harrison's request. Speaking of Harrison, he really lives up to the quiet Beatle moniker in part two. I know his feelings were complex considering his recent walkout and return, but I would have loved to have seen him more active in the studio, at least musically. That said, the take of For You Blue at around 2 hours and 28 minutes is insanely good. Again, like the take of Dig a Pony that I mentioned earlier, the whole setup here, cameras, lights, etc., could have been for this one performance. It's that good. Aside from the highlights, there were some lowlights too. Moments where you may wonder if part two really needed to be nearly three hours long. Some chats were just not that interesting, at least for a normal audience of casual fans. But when you consider that this is almost tailor-made for fans like us, the diehards, any talk of proper pacing can go out the window. After all, an early cut of the new documentary was a staggering 18 hours long, so let's not worry about the total runtime. As for me, I'll never complain about too much unseen Beatles footage. 
Now, I know by the time I post this video, many of you will have already seen part three. I'd say I can't wait to see it, but there's a part of me that wants to not watch it right now, to save it for a rainy day. Again, we've been talking about this project for three years, or in some cases for longer, even 50 years. And we only get one shot to watch this material for the first time. But ultimately, I think I'll cave, not just because of making videos for this channel, but because I need to get off the roller coaster. I need this project to have its triumphant ending. We know how the Beatles story ultimately ends. The music of the Let It Be era really doesn't hold a candle to the swan song of Abbey Road. But this Get Back project in a bubble, January 1969, deserves to be resolved and to have its music shouted from the rooftop. All right, so what about you? Are you pacing yourself, maybe trying to spread out watching the series? Or are you binging it with a plan to rewatch it later? Let me know down in the comments what you're thinking. All right, thanks for watching. You can likely check back here for part three tomorrow if you're watching this in real time. Or if not, there's probably a link next to my noggin over here somewhere. All right. Off to part three for me. Take me to the roof.